Welcome to Selling in the Motor Trade, in association with Automotive Management and Simcoe Training. This is the weekly podcast where we share best practice, tips, and ideas on how to sell more cars, improve your service department, and generally put more profit into your dealership or dealer group. I'm your host, Simon Bokert, or some of you might already know me as Skippy. And firstly, I want to say thank you for taking the time to tune in. Hi, and welcome to another episode of Selling in the Motor Trade. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Fred Copeskate. Okay, oh, I haven't pronounced that right. Fred, you're going to get that right for me in a second. Now, let me tell you who Fred is. Fred is the best-selling author of Hybrid Selling. He's also uh, another book he's written, Selling Through Partnering Skills. And Fred talks about the evolution of the sales process. Uh, before we did this podcast, we were talking about Fred about how selling has evolved in the times. And he's got this great training where it goes through from the 50s, 60s, all the way to 2000, and how the whole sales process has evolved and how sometimes we as salespeople haven't evolved. So this is one of those episodes, again, you might want to uh, send it through to your whole sales team. You might want to let them to have a listen to this in your sales meeting. So Fred, welcome aboard. Ah, thank you very much. You got the name right as well. Hey, I Bang did. on. You, I, I didn't get chopstick, cupcake, soap flake, <laughs> cheapskate. <laughs> you get all of those. All of those. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Now, listen, this is uh, for selling in the motor trade. So we always like to ask our guests about their motoring history to start with. So, Fred, your first car that you bought, uh, do you remember what it was? It was a Peugeot. Mm. 109 i think a little silver number yeah okay okay Uh, 109 silver number it was your silver i remember it's 109 it was a small one it was i was just out of uni and i'm much money that's fair enough it was a small one okay uh i'm just thinking about asia maybe a 106 maybe something like that um 108 uh 107 doesn't matter Listen, it's one of those it, it was kind of the bottom of the range smallest one he got a little bit of a boot um it, it, and it's good it, it suited me suited me going boot, from benning up to literally okay. every day i grew up in australia so uh the guys now are going to say come on so i mean you don't know your cars over in the uk market okay so uh, you bought it first car out of university yeah i i, so I got a job straight out of uni um in fact, I got a job before I finished uni. It was, I was very naive. I got offered a job and I started two days after my last final. Okay. All, all, my mates, all my mates were partying and I'd started work, which is yeah, a bit, bit sad. So I borrowed a car um, from mum and dad from a family company, but they couldn't let me have that forever. So then I had to buy one. And uh, yeah, this, this, little, this little silver Peugeot thing was ideal. I think it was one litre. Oh, okay. Did you buy it through a, a <laughs> franchise car dealership or did you buy it uh, independent from a... Um... Uh, it would have been dad would have had a mate who had a mate or something like that, I'd have thought, you know. <laughs> <laughs> something like that. Well, listen, um, let's tell the people listen to this uh, a little bit about yourself, okay? Um, you're uh, the expert in the, the hybrid selling, selling through partnering skills. Um, tell us a little bit about what does that mean and tell us a bit about your organisation. Sure, yeah. I mean, so I've, I've been tra- uh, self-training quite a long time, 20 three years now <laughs> been around the world a load a load of times 14 times and uh that's just kind of a calculation but i've worked in 30, 30 36 countries uh trained you know 10,000 salespeople, and mm-hmm. it's by doing that that i was able to recognize the challenges that they face now well, first thing is i, I work in b2b sales complex okay. sales normally so complex the way we tend to describe that will be that it's it got more people involved in the decision. It's a slightly longer process and it's quite sophisticated and there's there's lots of moving parts to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, a fleet sale actually would probably be the, the, yeah. the equivalent. Yeah, of it sounds very much like that, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so and I kind of recognize these these uh, these issues that people have got and you can pretty much whoever you work with, is it IT, is it beer, is it ingredients, is it whatever, you know, machinery. They, they've got similar stuff. And so well, I can go into those in, in, a, in a while, but really to to solve these what i came up with was that you need to be looking at the stuff that's gone on before that Mm. still works and still relevant and still valuable you also have to bin some stuff that's gone on before because it's not helpful at all it's actually damaging Mm -hmm. you take that on one hand but what we need to do is to develop a collaborative mindset so how do you develop a collaborative mindset how do you work more with a customer how do you co-create well that's by entering it 
by using partnering skills. So think of the customer as a partner, even if it's not a formal uh, alliance, a formal you know, business rela relationship. By thinking like a partner, you will act better. And I came across this concept of PQ. Like PQ, sorry, did you PQ, say PQ? PQ, yeah. So yeah. I've IQ not heard that. EQ. Forgive my ignorance then. Yeah, no. So you've probably heard of IQ, got a thought, you know, yes. how intelligent you are. EQ is also how intelligent you are, but it's like your emotional intelligence. PQ is your partnering intelligence. And then, so this isn't, this isn't something I made up. It's um, a guy called Steve Dent did a load of work on this uh, back in the late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. When you know, when big companies were doing their, their alliance type stuff, yeah, the airlines were coming together, weren't they? And forming these yeah. big you know, kind of things, and they wanted to get better and better at it. And I asked him to research how do you do it? How do you what, what do we what do the organizations need to do? And he's did the research and came back to them. And cut long story short, said, Well, organizations don't partner, people do. Mm -hmm. Partner skills are people skills. And so when you look at these, I, I looked at these things and I thought, Well, you know what those things should be relevant for any salesperson. If, you, if you're not baking these into the way you operate, you're not up to date. You're doing stuff from a bygone era and you're not, you're not thinking right. You won't be able to behave in a way that's most effective. So I kind of brought the stuff that still works that into the, the, the model I use to, to help um, those salespeople get, get better. At what Fred, I, I suppose, am I right in saying, we, we would say in the retail car sales world that uh, people buy people. Um, and we, we would say that there's three sales in any sale. You go sell yourself first, yep. the product second, yep. and then the deal. And too often, I personally see salespeople try and sell the deal first, the deal second, and the yep. deal third. Is yep. that where you're talking about? There's partnering skills to start with. This PQ is how much they sell themselves first. To a degree, it's, it's. I think it probably goes a bit deeper than that. I mean, the okay. people by people thing is great, but then that's yeah. some sometimes that's all people do they try to be somebody's best mate and like don't yeah. do anything else they don't really concentrate yeah. well, what's the person actually need you know what they're trying to achieve here what yeah. would a good deal look like for them um and so what what the partner skills does again it, it helps you think about okay so if i'm working with this person if i'm going to be kind of in a relationship with them yeah and okay b2b sales often you are because it's a sort of longer term stuff yeah. but even if you're not i mean this is what i tested my own thinking on most car sales i thought well actually they, these guys aren't going to be in in relationships like you know, buy one but if you think like you are the way you conduct that sale will be better and these elements there's six elements to pq that if you think about can i can i wrap this into the way i operate it will make me a better salesperson you'll come across better you you know what happens in the way you're talking to a customer that in reality you may never see again but mm. well, why not why not <laughs> people buy cars on a pretty regular basis it, I, I think it i think it would work in this world as well i really do yeah yeah, I, and you were dead right. The top salespeople that we meet in the car dealer world, retail world, okay? Yeah. And we always say, you know, anyone can sell one car. We don't mm. want to do that. We want to sell people their next car, next car, and family, friends' cars. Um, we, we work with a, uh, a big leasing company, okay? Mm. And the vast majority of their business at the moment, they're doing so, so, so well. It's because of that repeat business, because yeah. they've actually spoken to people again and again, and they've looked after them right the first time round. Um, so yeah, it is definitely uh, in the car sales world. Uh, we, we definitely talk about that approach. We let's need test to it. Should we, let, should we test the elements of PQ and like yeah. see if we go, no, we don't need that in this world. Yeah. yeah Cause that's what I say. You need this in B2B. Absolutely. No arguments about it. Yeah. yeah. And I've the fleet sales here. people listen to this and actually Mr. Uh, Mr. Right. <laughs> Uh, the guys listen to this. Uh, his friend's just got a mug there that says Mr. Right on it. So um, uh, he is Mr. Right. Okay. Okay. So there's the six elements to it. I mean, we'll, we'll go through them. They, they, they all work together. Um, yeah. We have to go through sequential. First one, trust. Yeah. And we have to build trust. Um, you know, if you're not trustworthy, if people can't feel as though, you know, what you say, what you do is, is right for them, it's going to be very difficult to move any kind of stage for sale further. I'd have thought yeah. and that's that's probably the people by people expression yep yep the trust is definitely there how many people when they start their search uh for the car world they look at google reviews now the trust pilots yeah. um yeah. You, you think about ebay um our, our um, sales director darren bedford always says think about ebay someone you don't know they're going to send you a secondhand product through the mail you're going to send the money first and hope it turns up ebay wouldn't have worked if it wasn't for that that trust rating there that, yeah. hey, listen, this eBayer is a nine star or whatever they call it, or a hundred percent or whatever it is on there. Um, so yeah, trust definitely works in our world. That's there's, a, there's a really interesting way to look at trust that I came across, I put into the book. Um, 
well, it was developed by a couple of Harvard business professors. So, I mean, yeah. <laughs> you're going to expect it. It's the trust equation. They, they write how to build trust as an equation, which is so cool. Right. T equals C plus R plus I over S. Okay, so T equals credibility. Okay, mm -hmm. do you know your stuff? Fine, yeah. Reliability, do you do what you say you'll do? Intimacy, you know, is the information I'm going to give you safe? You know, you're not going to kind of abuse that. Well, you wouldn't, because that's for GDPR and the rest of it. So, yeah, that's good. Yeah, we do all that. Of course we do. Yeah. Now it's an equation because it's divided by S. S oh, yes. is self-orientation. Okay. So you're, are you doing that stuff because you're doing it for your own benefit or are you genuinely doing it for the other person's benefit? So as the equation, if you're doing it for your own benefit, it brings your score down. Yeah, okay. Right. So yeah. you do all these things, but you're genuinely doing it for the other person. And people can detect this stuff. When yeah, you are okay. definitely got someone else's best interest at heart, that is, that's one of the best things you can do for building trust. Yeah. Okay. Big so the first one definitely fits in any selling environment. Yeah. yeah. Dead right. And the right. next one? Number two win win focus okay I, I, again I'm, I'm pretty sure you guys talk about that anyway you know as soon as you've got to lose win there's going to be no sustainability about it yeah so lose win it's gonna be i end up selling a load of stuff i don't make any money on well i'd be crazy i would yeah. have a job for long will i <laughs> yeah win lose well i've won but i've ripped the customer off ah <laughs> well to me yeah no because they will realize they'll find that out they're not going to come back to you they'll bad mouth you it's again it's not sustainable so it's got to be win-win. This is a good deal for me. It's a good deal for you. It's the right thing. I'm making a decent amount of money on it. We know I'm not in it as a charity. Hey, this is cool. If we get yeah. our focus and we know what we're trying to achieve from that basis, again, better position to be selling from. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, again, the win-win, I, I think you're right. This is fitting on every selling environment there. Okay. The next one is? Right. Comfort with interdependence. Good well, you're going to have to explain that to me. Now, I've got to explain. Right. Fred, my biggest word is corrugated iron. Okay, I started washing cars for a living, so you're going to have to break that one down for me. Oh, I will do, mate. No worries. So interdependence. The easiest way to think about this is that your success is my success. If a salesperson thinks like that, again, it changes what they say, what they do, how they interact with customers, how they interact with colleagues, and it just changes the whole dynamic. If I go off as a lone wolf and I become really independent and I'm trying to do everything on my own, I don't you know, kind of work with my team well, and I don't really care about whether that car's right for you, a bit like the win-win stuff. Yeah. Again, what, what goes on in the sale is wrong and it's unlikely to be a successful sale. Again, certainly going long-term, but probably even in the moment. Mm. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, it is very similar to win-win, isn't it? Yeah, it, it's, 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 the, 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 I mean, all these things are connected. If you can imagine, yes, you know, of we, course, we do yeah. a kind of overlapping, overlapping? Overlapping yeah. Venn diagram, we'd see them come into play. Yeah. Okay. And then we've got transparency. Okay. Right. This is being open. This is being honest. This is being straight up if there's something that isn't quite right or isn't going to work or you've made a mistake or something like that. Okay. This is a hard one. This is counterintuitive to a lot of salespeople. We'd like to think it's not, though, isn't it? Don't <laughs> we? We'd like to think a lot of things. <laughs> Don't we have to be open? Again, yeah. if uh, that transparency, if we're going to be lying to customers, um, um, I, I think in the motor trade, we've got the FCA, Fred, and yeah. the FCA just wants to make sure we're regulated to sell insurance products. Yeah. And the big thing is when you dig into it, they just want to know that people know that they have gap insurance. Because so many times in the past, the PPI scandal, People were bundled up onto their mortgage and buying a sofa and they had protected payments and didn't know it was there. Um, I'd love to think in the motor trade, the people listen to this podcast, that transparency, we'd love to think that's a, that's a given now, but I suppose maybe it's not. I think it probably, what, what you're defining is transparency and what I do and ah. how it can be used goes even further. Okay. So th there's a guy that I've got a lot of time for, an American author called Todd Capone. Mm -hmm. Sounds okay. a bit mafioso, doesn't it? But Todd's yeah. a great guy. He's a bigger sales geek than me when it comes to history of sales, by the way. Right. Um, okay. But his book, The Transparency Sale, he talks about leading with a flaw. So something that might not be quite right for the customer. Right. Rather than talk about all the good stuff and think, God, I really hope they don't ask me about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, tell you what, Mr. Customer, what I'm going to show you, this bit here isn't really quite right for you. Or there's a bit of a mistake here. Or there's a ding here. Or there's something wrong with this. Mm -hmm. Okay. However, what I why I'm showing you is because all these other things are right for you. Yeah. That smart. was the most important thing for you. It's not right. Now, as soon as you've done that, that's a massive trust builder, isn't it? That's kind of like, wow, yeah. 
That's that, you, you can imagine people rocking back thinking, I thought you said you could tell me everything's perfect. No, I'm going to be realistic here. Well, let me uh, run this past you. Maybe our train, we, uh, we do um, a selling the online world where we talk about how to do see it now videos and ah, videos yeah. on the car through the people. You, you've probably seen it buying a car yourself, okay? Yeah. And something we always do is we find out some the stone chip on the car or yeah. something there, and we point out every time, Fred, we say, hey, listen, the only thing I want to point out is there is a stone chip down here. Now, I will touch it in myself for you, but I thought you'd like to see it before I yeah. touch that in. Now, yeah. Fred, we're guilty. We would do that right at the end of the call yeah. to action. Maybe we should bring that right to the beginning of those videos there. Uh, on a used vehicle, obviously, not a new car. Um, <laughs> we really need to maybe look at that because I, I get the, the idea of building that trust so quickly to start with. There's an interesting psychology in it, and Todd goes into it in a whole lot of detail in the book as to why you would do that. Because if you're doing that, and it's not, it's not this sort of manipulative selling anymore where you're trying to disarm a customer, mm. but it's just a, well, okay, that's, that's pretty straight up for you. That's cool. Yeah. Because it's almost like this is getting too good to be true. And the more you say how good it is, I'm going to be listening. Well, it's, no. Mm. If something's too good to be true, it probably isn't. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's lead with the flaws is an interesting, uh, interesting. Yeah, story. great. Yeah, great. Okay. And then after that, we talk about comfort with change. Comfort okay. with change. Now, again, we're talking B two B sales. A lot of time, people are trying to sell change. They're trying to get people to do something differently or to do it in a different way, um, which is going to involve some kind of change. Now, if we're not comfortable with change ourselves, you know, what, what leg have we got to stand on asking somebody else to? Yeah. Um, Ch change is difficult you know asking asking someone to do something that they're not accustomed to you get some quite deep reactions to it and while for us it might be logical and really obvious and this is why you want to buy this car because uh, you know why wouldn't you yeah. it's all like, oh, i've always had this brand or i like this one i don't want to get rid of it that emotional attachment people have yeah again if you understand how people go through the change change curve the different ways of reaction some people love it some people hate it again it just helps how you can change what you say and do to, to just land your message better. A, a question then, um, we have lots of customers looking at the EV route. That's yeah. <laughs> huge change, okay? Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got lots of people uh, nervous about uh, yeah. range anxiety. Can I charge it when I go and see my mother up in Edinburgh? Do yeah. I have to stop? Uh, when I stop at that petrol station, are there enough changing points? And that that's such a huge uh, challenge that we need to overcome because yeah. we're asking consumers to make the biggest change in mm -hmm. their motoring needs for uh, ever for most yeah, yeah. definitely for me i'm uh, 48 now i've been driving since i'm 17 years old plugging a car in as opposed to not putting petrol in it is a huge change there yeah. so uh, our job is to really uh, find out their pain points first uh, yeah. and see if we can overcome those pain points is that what we really need to do that. Yeah, I mean, the thing that the, the, the other kind of tip or, or kind of way of addressing this I'd give is that if you're doing this day in, day out, and you are have worked out in your own mind why actually it's a really good thing, and actually it's quite exciting, and it is a step forward, and hey, let's go for it, electrification, here we come, happy days, all those so many good stuff, and you'll get excited and you'll talk about it like that, you know, full of enthusiasm, pumped. Now, if somebody isn't, when you think about a change curve, it looks a bit like a grief curve. It's like they will be in denial that even they have to change. Oh, no, 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 that legislation isn't going to happen. They're going to change it ultimately anyway. Well, no, they're not, <laughs> you know, or no, I don't want to have to change. They'll go through anger. Yeah, they'll go through this kind of, OK, I'm starting to make sense of it, but I'm kind of balancing up whether I like it, whether I don't. Yep. If you're not matching or you're not recognizing where they are and you're trying to sort of blast it all with your enthusiasm it, it 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 won't work it'll antagonize a little bit so it's kind of sometimes that they're at this stage this is where they are we just need to go to slow down a little bit just deal with that concern go a bit steadier if someone's yeah. excited about it yeah we can be as excited as we want to so I, just I recognize tell that you. people go through that that curve at different paces but we all go through it a, a good friend of ours andrew dent is doing uh, educational events in dealership world and it really is doing exactly what you're talking about, sensational. And um, this, this is not a sales pitch because Andrew Dent reached out to him at Connectivity, uh, the people listen to this. So many people are nervous about the EV. So they're having events not where they're trying to sell people things, not yeah. when they've got the bouncy castle type thing or balloons <laughs> out the front. They're saying, listen, come along to these events and we've got the experts from the, the solar companies. If you want to go down solar, or the charging, all the different charging applications, uh, the different, not just trying to sell that brand of EV vehicle, 
because he's identified and he's right there. The actual vehicle is the last part of the puzzle for a customer. They're worried about how do I charge it at home? How do I do it? And it's just this educational event and the success he's having from those yeah. is huge because it's that, that denial that people are talking about, I don't want to change. I, I do have to change. There's not enough charging points. That anger almost, I don't want to give up my mm. petrol engine. Mm. I remember yeah. my father-in-law saying, nah, I'll never give it up. Okay, it's in my <laughs> blood there. But you know what? He's now saying, oh, that Taycan, Apparently, its performance is quite nice. It's not like a milk quality. So, um, again, that's a bit of a plug for Andrew Dent. But um, these these events, where it's pure educational, is um, it's not selling at all. But what yeah. they're selling off the back of it is huge. I'm going to go along for those events because I've got a guess at what Andrew will be doing here. He will have plenty of logic. He'll have plenty of facts and figures, which yes. he'll give. But I suspect he'll be wrapping a load of stuff up with stories. He'll be giving people stories that they can take and tell mm. so that people can understand the change and understand why these things are happening and how to deal with them. Yeah. And the important thing of this is, is because when you try and bomb someone with logic, we don't make decisions logically anyway. We make them emotionally. Yeah. Best way to get an emotional message across to somebody is to tell them a story. Yeah. Like somebody who is in a position like them, but this is how they came out well from doing this. Yeah. Okay. If you can equip yourselves with those things and then use that in the pitch as you're trying to persuade or move people towards it you do a way better job yeah stories do so yeah stories right <laughs> they do and then we've got one more go on future orientation future orientation so again this is what good sales people will do it's rather than kind of always dwell on the past or make decisions looking backwards rather than think about you know kind of what we're doing here and now when we can get people looking forward and we can work out what it is they're trying to achieve, we know what their vision are, the goals, targets, and then we can work out what is the path to get to there to achieve it and make decisions and plan based on it. Again, the, the, the way we talk and the stuff that we do will be far more effective than always looking in the mirror and say, oh, well, you know, EV, let's talk about that. Oh, electric cars you know, used to have no range capacity at all. Yeah, well, they've got a lot better. Oh, there weren't any charges anywhere there's quite a lot now you know and yeah. let's not look backwards all the time let's look forward where it's going how many more they're going to be again it's that focus and how it changes how and what we talk about that makes a difference mm, okay uh, good stuff interesting stuff there tell us tell us about your background then so what did you start selling before you went into be sales training um how do you are from uni how do you get to where you are now well, well i'll say i got a job straight away that's because i was having a beer in a rugby club one weekend um, chatting to a guy I'd never met before, asked me what I was studying, said commerce and Spanish. Yeah. Do you speak Spanish then? Yeah, I do. Um, and that was it, really. I got a call a couple of days later where this guy tracked me down and said, look, I want to speak to you because we've got a project coming on in Spain and we need a Spanish speaker who's got a bit of understanding of marketing. Sounds like a loud deal person. Wow. And what company was that in? Uh, so this was a company called IMI. Okay. Not Automotive IMI, <laughs> Good. Um, okay. IMI in Birmingham, um, which was Imperial Metals Industries originally, um, okay. but I was pneumatics basically. So you know, pneumatics, which will be in the in, in the workshops with all that yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, um, or the cylinders putting the, the ramps up and down. Yeah, it was that. It was working for a company called that. Yeah, but, okay. but spending four years doing a degree in commerce and Spanish <laughs> to sell industrial. Okay, so you, that's where that was your start into the sales. That, that, was, my, that was my very first job. Yeah, so it was, it was helping them launch his products in Spain. So in sales, I was sort of kind of marketing, then into sales, back into a kind of more, more marketing business development role, where I ended up. Uh, I, was, I was business development manager for Western Europe. Okay. okay. And on the subject of cars, this was really important because I got a company car. Yeah. And I was the only person in the company that had a two-door company car. <laughs> okay. A Rover Two Hundred and Twenty GSI. The wow. Rover 220 GSI. That was like a rocket, just the sort of thing you want to give to a 23-year-old. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Then. It was crazy. So, I did get stopped doing it over a time. But anyway, that's a different story. So um, what no, was, and so, <laughs> what was I, one of your greatest days when you were selling then? Um, I, so I, I, I led the sale of, um, I mean, I, I sell myself a lot now, and a lot of the projects I do are selling me. And you know, I, I yeah. talked about why Brindis is Brindis, my, my company name, it's Spanish for toast. And I kind of sold to Corona that they should set up an academy up and I should run it. 
Corona. <laughs> so, so I, re- I, Corona wrote, I wrote myself a job spec and fly around Europe training people how to sell beer. Uh, that's a pretty good sale. That was um, a good sale. That's going to be your greatest day. Yeah, no, it has. I was about to say something about an air fuse, which stops like pneumatic cues wiggling around if they break and the gun falls off. But no, giving myself a job flying around Europe training to sell beer, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that, that, that's pretty cool, yeah. <laughs> So why do you go from selling beer in Europe to uh, starting up uh, um, your sales round? Bendis, sorry. Am Brindis, no, so right? Brindis. So it's, that, that was part and parcel. So I was, I was actually, I missed that stage. So I was working for, for IMI, working mm-hmm. for IMI Norgren. Um, I went to work for a training company. So I worked full-time as a trainer for them. Yes. Um, looking after one of their open programs. Uh, it was whilst doing that that we started doing some work with Eurosurmex, which was the Mexican subsidiary. Oh, so the, Mexican, the subsidiary of the Mexican company, Group Modelo. Um, we did some work with them. That's when we started talking to them about the academy, to be honest. And they said, look, we can't do it for that. But if you want to do that, Fred, then that's great. And that's why yeah. I defy the job spec and sold myself in. Yeah. With, with the full blessing of the training company, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that was have my cake and eat it, because I ended up setting up my own company to do that. Yep. And still did work for the company I'd left. I mean, it was yeah. oh, happy days. <laughs> it was really cool. Um, and so yeah, that's 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 kind of that's how I moved into doing that and, and setting up training for them, for others, for other companies, and so I've been doing that doing that ever since. And then now, listen, you said before uh, something like thirty five different countries, travel around the world fourteen times, uh, yeah. ten thousand salespeople. Listen, yeah. you've seen a lot of good people in that time, yeah, and you've seen a lot of bad. I want yeah. to ask, what stands out? What makes a great salesperson great? What are some of the characters? traits what are some of the attributes that makes a great salesperson great in your opinion i the more and more i'm thinking about this the more it comes down very simply for me growth mindset against fixed mindset if you've got a growth mindset if you're always looking to develop if you're always looking to learn if you're always looking to get better if you're taking new ideas if you try to implement them if you want to keep making a difference to yourself you are very likely to be a great salesperson because you'll be <laughs> right up to speed all the time and, and easy to coach and easy to train and always on top of it. You know, you, you'll be current and relevant because sales is about relevance. Good sales practice now is about relevance. If you're fixed, as in, no, I know what I know and I don't need anything else. And I went on a training course 20 years ago and you can't tell me anything and I know what I'm doing and I don't want any help. Not only do you pull everyone else down, <laughs> but you're doing yourself no favors. Yeah. However, good news is I don't think there'll be room for that latter type much more in sales because we're changing at such a pace that they just won't won't survive so (laughs) yeah okay a growth mindset now listen what about the managers listen to this and you you must have come across this Ten thousand people where you got someone that's got all the raw attributes the skills to do it but they're just not performing and for me that's more of a uh, a motivation and attitude than a knowing how to do it you must have come across people like that. What advice do you have for that senior manager listening to this thing? And how do I get Johnny up to speed? How do I turn him back on when he was, you know what I mean, Fred, the guy that's yeah. great, but just overnight, something's gone wrong. Talk to them. And, and, that, and that, that isn't, I'm quite facetious sometimes, a bit flippant, as you've noticed. But no, I mean, often that isn't what people do because that's a difficult conversation and if any time there is time to talk to somebody that is it and it's kind of having that that conversation at the level of like you know what's going on you know is there stuff you know, perhaps outside of work that might be affecting you because actually if there is then whatever we do inside of work is going to be pre- pretty hard so you know we've got to be decent people from that point of view mm-hmm. then yeah, well, we should be talking to people all the time anyway if, if, if coaching is a kind of a, a one-off or a, a sort of an event to be celebrated on its anniversary, then, you know, that's, uh, that's wrong. We should be constantly talking, coaching, tweaking, encouraging, and giving people the best environment that they can, they can excel in. Mm. Um, which for me, you know, big fan of Daniel Pink, is PMA, Purpose, Mastery, Autonomy. Mm-hmm. Give them purpose, have them understand why they're doing stuff, something to work towards, some kind of direction. Give people the opportunity to, to master stuff to be as best as they possibly can mm-hmm. and give them some room to do it in their way you don't want a bunch of little robots i'm, I'm all for structure all yep. for frameworks yep. I've two books come on <laughs> but you've got to give them the space to do that stuff in and then support 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 keep talking to them how can we do better how can i help you and, and coach yeah. coaching is the okay. solution well, listen, before we uh, recorded this, you were talking about how you've done work with uh, Renault trucks and a truck sale is a complex sale. Okay. Yeah. It is a fleet sale there. 
Um, can I ask you, how has that changed uh, for you? Because we have the internet now, that mm -hmm. salesperson in that Renault truck uh, business there, uh, their day-to-day -day life now, how much is it through social media and LinkedIn and more of a marketing? Is Well, I suppose what I'm driving at, marketing or sales, are they kind of blending into one at the moment for that for that fleet salesperson? Um, I, I think I think it should. <laughs> and for the people I've trained, it, it definitely should be doing because that, that's what we've talked about. You know, it's um, selling isn't getting simpler. And I think good salespeople need to have more and more skills than ever before. And, and, and that's what that's what I was going at with, with the hybrid selling book. Yeah. Um, in the, you know, I think the analogy I said to you is that if you're, if your idea of selling is the equivalent of sort of, you've got one way and you like, imagine you're playing a drum, you've got a little drum and you're tapping away with one little stick and that's all you do. I mean, yeah. you might've got away with that, but that's not a very good performance really, yeah. you know, and you're not going to go on big stadium tours. Yeah. What we need to do is make sure people have got this full drum set with like you know, drums are kind of all these different skills, techniques, things that they can know how to do. Same as a drummer's got the, the, the piece of um, percussion equipment that they know that they can hit when they need to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, part of that is kind of thinking of it like a marketer, it's creating content. Mm -hmm. Salespeople that can create content and create, you know, start to build their personal brand big time, makes sense. Yeah, yeah? so you really are an advocate. Different types of outreach that they can, you know, comfortable in video as they are in, um, in, in, in you know, across a desk and that's asynchronous and synchronous oh there's yeah. the words <laughs> sending it talking live you know there's so many things that, that we need to up a game with yeah i i think it's so true in this um uh, for me personally because you know we're probably a complex sales company because we're selling to oems and manufacturers and all the time that's uh our dealer groups i should say that's really who we sell to um, so I suppose it is a complex sale. I've just never thought about it. I always see myself as a car salesperson because that's where I come from and that's what we do and that's what we teach lots of there. But really, we are doing what you're talking about day in, day out. And I want to get your views on this. Sorry, and just I to jump in, there's, a, there's another shift. If you're involved in that kind of sale, mm. selling maybe fleet cars, fleet trucks. I mean, if you're selling one truck, to be fair, you're not. You're actually selling outcomes. That, that's when you can get your head around that stop talking about the metal often the metal is the least important part yes yeah that's what we spend loads and loads of time training people to <laughs> be able to talk about but actually it's a well, why are people buying this metal yeah don't they? it's a box on wheels isn't it to move stuff around what they're trying to move around where do they need to move it to yep. what's most important to them in the way they move it is it fuel economy is it speed is it reliability is it a mixture of those things that's the conversation to be having not it's got a retractable fifth wheel, it's got locking wheel nuts, it's got a yeah. little fridge in the back. They could become important, but if that's all you're talking about, that isn't the outcome, it's the, the solution, the result that people are trying to buy from you. Yeah. So I want to get your view on this one. Most of my selling since uh, COVID-19 has been this way via Zoom. Okay. We have clients. Um, hi, Neil and Kevin. I know you listen to this. Uh, I've not seen them yet. Okay. Um, and we've done their training for the last... Uh, I, I think it's two years now, okay, come out to two years. And I, I, I need to get out there. I feel guilty because they're, they're great people. I need to just fly out and catch up with them, okay? And Kevin, if you listen to this, there's my apologies. I will put that date in the diary and get it sorted. But the, the thing I'm going to say is all of my selling is done this way now, yeah. okay? Everything is done this way. Um, very uh, even clients in this country, our clients are preferring this. Are you finding that in the truck world, in the complex world, that Zoom, Teams, whatever, uh, or do you think we need to get back to face-to-face -to -face and um, press the flesh, as they would say? Do what's right. <laughs> well, what a helpful answer, Fred. But what I mean by that is if somebody very much wants to see you face-to-face, -face, okay, well, that's what you're going to have to do. Mm -hmm. But don't be forcing to try to see them face-to-face -face if they're saying, you know what? I'm okay on Zoom. Yeah. Oh, no, but surely it's better face-to-face. -face. No, because if it's face-to-face, -face, I've got to the office because you've got to come to my house. I like working at home two, two days out of the week. You know, it's when you come to the office, I know you've driven miles. And so you're going to want to talk forever. I can do this in 15 minutes. And I'm okay doing that on Zoom because we can chat and then I can turn it off. You know, and a lot of people are just happier doing it. They just find it easier, way more convenient. Now, the, the diary can then be quite tiring because it starts to look like a patchwork quilt. But if that's what someone wants to do, do it. Yeah, I, I suppose it's efficiency. Um, and it's, um, I, I can remember before all this happened, Darren and I went out to Marinello for a meeting. 
That involved me driving from Cheshire yeah. down to Luton. We jumped on a, a, a hotel the night before, jumped yeah. on a Ryanair flight, which was delayed. Okay. Um, got late for the meeting in Maranello. I then fucked the whole meeting up. Thank you very much, Ferrari. <laughs> okay. But I did. Okay. And you know when I got it wrong, and I did on that one. Uh, drove back to the airport, um, flew back to Luton. I got home after stuffing this meeting up, you might add. Okay. Beat myself up the whole time. Okay. I got in at like one o'clock in the morning or something like that. And I'm just thinking, you know what? I've wasted two days effectively yeah. for that meeting that I got wrong. Whereas I could quite easily get it just as wrong and just as quickly here, okay, and get more efficient on doing other stuff. So I, I suppose it's how efficient does that salesperson have to be? You can obviously get to more people this way as opposed to pressing the flesh. I I do. No, I, yeah, <laughs> you just mess the foot faster. <laughs> what great way of selling video. <laughs> yeah. No, nobody... It, it, I, I I I love it as a way of working as well. It is way more effective, you know. You can and you, know, you work globally. I work globally. It's like you can just do so much more. And I, I've done training sessions seven o'clock in the morning. There's one company seven o'clock in the morning with their APAC people, and then three o'clock in the afternoon for Europe and US. It's just like there we go. Rubbish on collecting air miles, but it's mm. it's very very effective. Mm. Now some people still don't like it. They say you can't build a relationship properly, and I I'll push back on that. And go well you probably want to have a look at your relationship building skills because if you can't build a relationship by talking to somebody with all of the channels that you've got you've got emails you've got this you've got everything you can see them you can hear them you can meet more often hmm. i mean really you know maybe you could try to get back on them and meet them can I, can I just talk to you every tuesday for the next two weeks to try to you know so you can because you can have more meetings more often also you can pull people together again bigger bigger ticket sales more people involved people in different parts of the world Again, get them all in on a on one call, mm. and 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 for me, and people aren't using this at the moment. Yeah, uh, I, I know sending video, sending video is a biggie. That is really cool. Yeah, I think this is one stage where the the motor trade is so much further ahead than most mm. other industries. Yeah. Um, we we wouldn't have a client now that isn't used to sending a, a, a yeah. see it now video out there on that new or used vehicle. Now, I don't think it's used uh, enough. I think the qual no, let me rephrase that. Um, I think the quality of those videos sent, and be it WhatsApp or see it now or anything like that, could be improved. They definitely could be improved in a lots and lots of cases. But the impact of video, it's not the future. It's the now. And, yeah, and I yeah. say we're, we're so often we're teaching or we're selling to the YouTube generation. Hmm? If we want information on how to fix that mower that's not starting. You want information on how to uh, cook the Christmas dinner in the right way. Don't we just go to YouTube? Yeah. Don't we try and get that information there? And, and the other thing I push back on is... Well, if you can't build that personal rapport this way, I get why people think that, but I often think they've been subjected to someone sitting down, reading through a PowerPoint presentation there. Yeah. And it's that presentation was not right as opposed to keep it live. Because I always say that, hold on, through a screen, Mr. Steven Spielberg, he can get lots of emotion out of people, okay? In uh, when E.T. passes away or something like that, okay? Or uh, yeah. fear, where that shark has come to someone. Of course, we can get emotion through this medium of video. Um, so, so I'm intrigued. I've never, mainly because I've not bought a car, if I've got rid of one because I don't need one anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, but the seeing now videos I've heard of, I'm, um, sorry I'm intrigued. That. You don't want to speak to you anymore. You don't buy cars. This is for the motor trade. So thank you. And now, <laughs> <laughs> how to win friends and influence yes, people. Yes, you don't have a car. I was doing so well. Oh, they're all going, Fred Kempstake <laughs> hasn't got a car. Oh, yes. How is my LinkedIn going to be hit up now? <laughs> <laughs> got a deal for you how can you no well, i'm intrigued with the the see it now and which way the mm. camera's pointing yeah great. is it 100 percent pointing at the car and you're talking about whether it's got whatever whatever, whatever, whatever. See, that is such an does it start off pointing at the salesperson saying something like hi making this video for you because it was really good when we chatted you said to me that what you're looking for is a car that does x and y and z this is why i found this one i think it's gonna be brilliant because i'm going to show you a couple of things on it then you turn it around and then you're going into the car. You've kicked off with the base, the voice, the person, the human. I, I don't know. I don't know how you coach that stuff. So that's uh, 100%. Crazy. It has to be that way. <laughs> it has to be that. But hang on. And I think one of the best in the motor trade, 
of uh, teaching that. I love uh, a lady called Jennifer Suzuki, and she would train that uh, absolutely. Uh, you hit the nail on the head, not being out. However, we get the resistance salespeople saying, oh, no, it's just the car. It's just the car. Getting people saying, well, I don't want to show you my face. Simon, I've got a face for radio. When, well, they're going to see you when they turn up anyway. They're not going to pick up their car and you've got a brown paper bag over your head. Okay, start with your face because people buy people. I, I, I'll give you a little story on this one. Uh, I was at a conference in the States and I've seen this with my own eyes. It was Barack Obama. Uh, start off saying, hi, welcome to the National Automotive Dealers Association. I'm Barack Obama. I want to introduce you to my good friend, this presenter, who's going to... I went, wow, that's some sort of endorsement. But then, of course, it wasn't Barack Obama. There's one of these things called deep fakes. Oh, deep where, fake, yeah. <laughs> where they've actually got Barack Obama's enough, I'm guessing, enough video images of him, and then they could get him to say what he wanted. Now, here's the thing. They were going on to how this is the future of marketing, okay? They won't steal Barack Obama's stuff like they did for this presentation. They'll have a celebrity that we follow, we're interested in. If someone's really interested in, um, yeah. I don't know, the, who's the fat bum family? Um, um, oh. The fat bum family, Kardashians. Yeah, you knew it. <laughs> I think you, you, you meant it. as well. That's funny. You knew it as well, okay? <laughs> They'll get their favorite Kardashian, turn around and say, Hi, Fred. I know that my uh, your wife is going to love this perfume because it's what I wear myself. Fred, you should buy this for your wife because her, her birthday is coming up soon. And I think that's going to be brilliant. Now, of course, she'll be paid for that to do it. But what I say all the time is that's coming in the future. I can see how that's the next trend in marketing. But you know what? With the beauty of uh, uh, just WhatsApp, car salespeople, you can do that now by yeah. turning the camera around to your face and say, hey, thank you very much for the inquiry. I just want to personally introduce myself so you can put a face to the name, so you know who's working for you behind the computer. And we don't have to have all this deep fake or whatever it was called there. Yeah. It's, it's coming, but that tells me these big marketing companies are spending millions of that because they know that people buy people. We trust people when we can put a face to the name. Um, so yeah, you hit the nail on the head for me on what yeah. has to happen. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Oh, I'm coming into this sector. No, 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 you're really. coming into the sector. <laughs> well, you're, you're in there with Renault trucks as well there. So yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, again, let, can I ask you, in that world there, uh, the Renault trucks as well, I'm imagining though, exactly what you said before, with the truck world there, and we'll touch on that as well, hmm. it's actually the trucks, the second part of it. It's the whole, so, so it's probably not as relevant, but still that person is relevant though, isn't it? The, the person is relevant and, and kind of the advice I give to the guys is, yeah, again, again, same, I've already said it. If you're just rocking up trying to be somebody's best mate, yeah. you're not going to get a good response. And they are, oh, you don't understand this. No, I say, I'm not saying the relationship isn't important, but what you've got to do is you've got to be relevant to them. If you're a good guy, but you're a good guy who knows some of the trends that are going on in the truck industry, and you've got a damn good pedigree of helping people to sort that stuff out, and you can tell them a bunch of stories where you've done that, and that they're a safe pair of hands because you don't mess stuff up, yep. then they'll talk to you. Yeah, so that's what we're trying to do. When we say people buy from people, it's people buy from people who are useful for them or relevant to them, yeah, who, who, who bring something to the table. Yeah. Um, you know, when our interactions aren't valuable, people just stop talking to you. And then we'll be seeing that. We're seeing B2B, there's lots of, you know, lots of data on this. And that a lot of customers in that world are trying to have a rep-free experience. Yeah. Salespeople aren't bringing enough to, to, to the party. So they just, oh, we're trying, to, we're trying to sort it ourselves. So Fred, how do people get more information on what you're talking about? How do they follow you on your podcast? How do they find your company? Tell, give yourself a plug on these books and how people can find them. Sure, LinkedIn. I mean, connect with me on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. um mention this podcast it's always great to know where, where people have come across me you know Your podcast um, is so the so so if you're on linkedin on my um on the little the link or the contact details i use a link tree so you click okay. on that it's basically it's one link but then i put all those links in it <laughs> so it's got links to all my social media at fred copestick anyway because nobody else wants that panel and what's um, the name of your podcast sales today Sales, sales today, today. It was nice called something simple. ridiculous which didn't have any relevance whatsoever relevance look back to relevance sales today because it's all about being bang up to date i interview a lot of people as well you know when we talk about video selling i've interviewed the guy who wrote the book on it you know we're talking yeah. about the sort of things which are about being current you know mm -hmm. i'll i'll get the guy and say look tell me about it don't tell anyone because i want to know <laughs> <laughs> listen thank you very much for your time i really do appreciate that uh so guys go and have a listen to sales today 
uh, grab one of Fred's books as well there. Follow him on LinkedIn there. And uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. That's a pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Good to see you. That just leaves me to say that all details of this episode and other episodes on the selling in the motor trade can be found on our website, simcotraining.co.uk. Go there to get a copy of our book, Words That Sell Cars. Go there to sign up to a free trial of our sales fitness online sales training program. Easiest way to get hold of me is Simon Bokert through LinkedIn. Thank you.